Sorry. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Just break things before I start. Um, I'm Rob. Um, some of you will know me. Apologies if I don't recognise your name. I'm much better with faces, but I definitely recognise some faces in the audience. Um, so, as um, Lauren <laughs> said, I work at the statewide Huntington's Clinic, which is held at the Royal Brisbane. And I can honestly say it's a real pleasure to work in that clinic. Um, so, I've always been a, a kind of person who enjoys other people. Um, and neurology can be a bit of a lonely specialty. I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. But often we just work in our, on our own in a, in a room and we see patients and they come in out one, one by one. Whereas in the Huntington's Clinic, we work as a team. Um, and that team involves people that we work with in the hospital, including the speech therapists, the neuropsychiatrists, the neuropsychologists, but also Tressa and Lauren, who you all know from, from Huntington's Queensland, who work out in the community. And it's, it's very rewarding as a clinician to be involved in, in a bit more than just the 20 to 40 minutes that we usually spend with our patients. Even though we hear about stuff outside, it's nice to have a bit more direct contact with the um, wider treatment for our patients. So um, it is a real um, pleasure to be involved um, in that service. I'm hoping this is going to start. Yeah. So with that background, I guess, can you hear me? Is, is this microphone working? Yeah, good. Um, it's, it is a very exciting time to be a neurologist, so um, hopefully you don't think I'm that old. Um, but even when I started in neurology, and I, I'll tell you I qualified nearly 20 years ago, it was really seen as a diagnostic specialty. Um, and certainly 100 years ago, there were no treatments for neurological disease. In the late 60s, early 70s, we developed some symptomatic treatments, or we, I wasn't even born, but there were some treatments for things like Parkinson's disease, but as Julie says, when it comes down to it, many of our treatments remain symptomatic rather than getting at the actual cause of the problem, and particularly in neurodegenerative disease. So my areas of interest and the patients I see have conditions like Parkinson's and Huntington's and, and dementias, and we're good at treating some of the symptoms in some of those conditions, not so good in other areas. So in Alzheimer's, we don't really have a great deal that even helps with the symptoms. But we don't have anything for any of them at the moment that gets at the nub of the problem and, and really treats the cause of the condition. And so last week I was in Philadelphia at the Academy of um, Neurology annual scientific meeting, which is a huge meeting attended by almost 15,000 people, so it's quite overwhelming and you have to be very kind of selective about which talks you go to. But the general feeling from the lectures and from attending the exhibits in the exhibition hall was of how many new therapies and new kinds of treatment, so not more of the same old stuff that perhaps we've been seeing since the 70s, like levodopa for Parkinson's disease, but all these novel ways of treating patients, both in terms of gene therapy and other kind of exciting, you know, maybe int introducing viral vectors into the brain. These are new technologies that we haven't had before. So there seems to be a, a kind of new window into treating perhaps neurodegenerative disease that hasn't existed before. And as Julie said, Huntington's disease may well be one of the first to benefit from these novel therapies and that's partly because we understand quite well why it happens. So to take Alzheimer's as an example where we don't really understand these things, Alzheimer's causes proteins to accumulate in the brain and there have been hundreds of studies as Julie said, some of which have been targeted at removing those proteins from the brain. But the truth is we don't know why those proteins get there. And even if we did, we don't know whether they're the real cause of the problem or if they're just a byproduct of something else. Whereas in Huntington's, we have the advantage of knowing why the protein is abnormal. And if we can prevent abnormal protein being created, then it makes sense that that treatment would work. So in a sense, we're already ahead of the game compared to other neurodegenerative conditions. And perhaps the reason that fewer trials have been done in Huntington's disease, or obviously the reason is because there are fewer patients suffering with the condition, but it doesn't mean it won't be at the kind of vanguard or at the forefront of understanding these processes for the future. So I just wanted to recap, because I think it's so important to understand what we know. 
So we know that Huntington's is a genetic condition, and we all have a Huntington's gene, but we, most of us have a, a normal range length of what are called CAG triplet repeats. So they encode a certain amino acid. So the DNA is a template, which then gets interpreted by copying it into something called mRNA that then gets turned into proteins. So you can imagine if the template's a bit out, then the copy gets a bit out, and so the protein can go a bit wrong. Um, and in general, the more of those repeats you have, the more abnormal the protein that gets produced is, and therefore the more likely you are to be symptomatic earlier in life or the more severe your disease might be. So what we're talking about, a bit confusingly, is the Huntington gene. So geneticists aren't always the most inventive in their naming, and they often call the gene the same name as they call the protein, which can make it a bit confusing. So they're both called the Huntington, but what we're talking about is trying to reduce the abnormal Huntington protein by stopping the transcription of abnormal Huntington genes. Because what we think is happening is that when the protein is abnormal, then it doesn't function properly. It's confusing, though, because Huntington is found in many bod body tissues, including red blood cells. And so that causes two problems, one being that probably hu abnormal Huntington in your red blood cells doesn't do anything bad to you, so far as we know. But also, if you, if you think about how you might do a trial, it would be great to measure the Huntington in your red blood cells, because doing blood tests is quite easy. But if that's not where the problem is, measuring it in your blood cells might not be very helpful. And so it might be that we need to develop new biomarkers, so kinds of tests that help us find out if our treatments are working. But again, as Judy said, what the regulators are going to care about is does it change symptoms in the end? And obviously we think the most likely cause of the symptoms of Huntington's disease is the action of um, abnormal Huntington in the brain. So normal Huntington lengths create the normal Huntington protein um, and it could be that abnormal Huntington can influence the action of other molecules or proteins in the cell, um, particularly in nerve cells, whereas perhaps in red blood cells it doesn't really cause any, any harm. So what can we do to prevent this? Well, I think this goes along with what Kat was saying. I think particularly 50 years ago, 100 years ago, many conditions, particularly neurological conditions or neuropsychiatric conditions, have been stigmatized. And so people are reluctant to talk about them, and they become a secret. And when it's a genetic condition, it can become a bit of a family secret. And so there's been a history of people not wanting to find out or, or not wanting to tell other family members about this condition. And I suppose that's understandable, particularly when there aren't any effective treatments. But now that there may be effective treatments coming along, and there are effective ways of having children, although they may not be the fun way, um, without passing on the gene, then it's even more important that people think about finding out. Now, obviously it's a very personal decision, but if you're an at-risk person, finding out now has potentially a lot more benefit than it might have done 10 or 20 years ago. So partly that's because of preconception counselling, um, and I'm not trying to tell you how to vote tomorrow, but I think free IVF should be available to people with genetic conditions. Um, I don't think anyone's campaigning on that. But, um, <laughs> but what about those people who have already, already know that they're carrying the gene because they're not going away? Can we prevent their gene causing the problem by preventing the production of this um, protein? So Julie's talked about this a bit already, but the trial that we're involved in in Brisbane is using one of these novel antisense oligonucleotides, which is a bit of a mouthful. But basically what an antisense oligonucleotide is, is a way of disrupting the transcription from the DNA into mRNA, 
which then prevents the mRNA from producing the abnormal protein. So it's a bit like a bit of software that goes in and blocks the code that's causing you a problem in your program. Part of the problem with antisense oligonucleotides, however, is that you can't just take a tablet and you can't have an injection into your blood because, as I've said, we think the problem is the proteins in your brain. And so the easiest way to get the proteins close to your brain is with an injection into the spinal fluid. Um, and then hopefully it will get incorporated into the cells that produce the abnormal protein in your brain and then pr prevent the protein being produced and then reduce the symptoms. So we've heard a lot about the IONIS trial which has now been picked up by Roche. Um, Sarah Tabrizi and Ed Wild at UCL have been very heavily involved in that and as Julie said it was just published last week in the New England Journal and they're a little bit ahead of the trial that we're doing um, with a different product. So our trial is a bit like IONIS was five years ago, I suppose. That's not to say that it's um, not going to work as well or less developed. It's just that the phases of clinical trials are in different places. So that's a mistake, sorry. It should say phase 1, 2A. Um, a bit jet lagged, that's my excuse. Um, so we're at the stage where we're testing the drug on healthy people and then people who are affected by Huntington's disease to see if it's safe. We're not looking yet at effectiveness, efficacy, um, like the Roche trial will be. That's phase three. First of all, we have to make sure, like they have, that it's safe. And of course, they've looked for changes in the Huntington expression in the spinal fluid, and we'll be doing that in the WAVE trial as well here in Brisbane. So does it work? We don't know whether either of these drugs work. Um, but so far, it looks like reducing that abnormal protein in, in the spinal fluid does seem to be safe. It doesn't seem so far to have caused any major problems for patients. But we don't know if reducing the spinal fluid protein really changes the outcome f for that patient in terms of disease and symptoms. The big hope is that other conditions have shown clinical benefit. So I'm not going to tell you all about this condition, but there's a quite a nasty condition called spinal muscular atrophy, which presents in infants. And one of these antisense oligonucleotides called nucinersin um, was the big news two years ago at the AAN in Boston. Um, and at that point, they'd done their phase three trials and shown effectiveness. And sure enough, two years later, this drug is being quite widely used and there's another agent available that has a permanent effect. So with nucinersin, I think they had to have um, intrathecal injections, so spinal fluid injections every three to six months for the first year and then six monthly afterwards. And that has two major problems. First of all, no one wants to have that many lumbar punctures. And second of all, it was very expensive. So about 150,000 US dollars per injection. And so that's fine when you're in a trial because the company pays for it. But in terms of healthcare systems and insurance, um, it's very expensive. So even in two years, they've moved from a drug that was having to be repeatedly injected, but is shown to be effective but very expensive, to a novel agent that might only be a one-off drug. So there's some hope out there that this has worked before for other conditions. <coughs> but what we don't know is, will these drugs that we're trialling have the same kind of effect in Huntington's disease because they're very different conditions. So I think as much as we're very excited to be doing these tests, we also have to temper that enthusiasm and excitement um, with being re realistic. So even though we might change the biomarker, so the level of the protein in the spinal, spinal fluid, that might not affect what happens in the disease. So we have to wait and see. But we'll only find out by doing trials. So I'll skip over this because Julie's kind of talked about it. So our trial is in phase one and phase two. So it's 2A, so looking at the safety in, in, in patients. It's not really 2B, which is the effectiveness, um, although you know, we, we might pick up on some effectiveness signal. But primarily, it's to look and see if the drug is safe. 
So the company I've been talking about is called Wave. They're based out of Boston um, in the US. And they're concurrently looking at two agents with these code names. They don't give them um, trendy names until they get to market. And they're running multiple sites around the world all the time. So this trial is already up and running in, in lots of different countries and in lots of different cities around the world. And you can see that despite the, the multiple sites being involved, the, the numbers they're aiming to recruit aren't that big. Um, and that's probably because it's difficult to recruit the kind of patients that fit the mould perfectly. Um, so there's obviously lots of excitement and interest in being involved in these trials, but you can imagine that when they're investing millions of dollars in doing a trial, they want to get the best results for that trial as possible, so they're quite strict about who can take part. Um, so at the moment, this trial is looking at patients who have carry the Huntington's gene, so they have to have at least 36 um, CAG repeats. But more than that, they're looking at an, another genetic marker, if you like, called SNP1 or SNP2. And so patients, even though they may have had a genetic test proving their Huntington's gene, will also have to have their blood sent again to look for the SNP1 or SNP2. So straight away, that will rule out some people because they won't have the right kind of variant that this trial is looking for. The second kind of inclusion criteria in the trial is to have some symptoms. So, you know, in, in time, I imagine, if these drugs work, we'll be wanting to do trials and treat patients who ha don't have symptoms yet, because just like in multiple sclerosis, why would you want to wait until you have disability? You'd want to be treated before that happens. But to begin with, and in this trial, we're looking at patients who have symptoms but who aren't too severe yet. Um, and we can talk about why that might be later on. So it's a, a placebo-controlled trial, so even if someone does get through the screening process and is thought to be um, suitable for the trial and they have their lumbar puncture, they, might, they still might not get the active drug because obviously in, in testing a, the safety of an agent you need to compare mm. with placebo because um, there's always an adverse event rate in a, any trial, so people get headaches and things like that, and we need to compare with placebo to see if that's just a chance, fact, a ch chance event or if it's genuinely due to the drug. And some patients will receive one dose, and some other patients will receive multiple doses, and in a second cohort of patients, they'll receive bigger doses. So just like the Roche trial where they looked at, it, Julie showed you that graph of different doses, so similarly the WAVE trial is going to try different doses because it's still at the stage where we don't really know which dose is going to be effective. So we're looking for mildly symptomatic gene positive patients, not asymptomatic or severely affected patients just yet. But many people think they're asymptomatic and haven't just aren't quite aware that they've had symptoms. So it's probably still, if you, if you know people who are interested or keen to be in trials, then um, coming along and, and us finding it, us deciding whether they're, they're eligible rather than deciding not, not to turn up. Um, because the screening's quite straightforward. So there's a clinical assessment which will be done by me or one of my colleagues. Um, and if we think clinically that someone's appropriate for the trial, then we'll send off the blood for those fancy genetic tests um, and that gets sent to the, st to the states. And so it's not that big of a deal to be screened. Um, and so, and, and there's also no major commitment, so if anyone gets screened and they d then decide not to be in the trial even if they are selected, that's also um, okay. So. There's fairly simple inclusion criteria. I just want to highlight, so it's between age 25 and 65. People who are very overweight can't take part because of the lumbar puncture being a bit more tricky, um, and um, we can't do the lumbar puncture using X-ray imaging, which is what we do in people who are a bit bigger. Um, and those genetic tests will determine 
the suitability for being in the trial. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to read this, but <laughs> I just put the exclusion criteria up here just to, just to reinforce that there will be some people that will be disappointed. Um, and that's, you know, that's nothing that we have control over. There are exclusion criteria that some people just, <coughs> means some people just won't be able to take part. So we're looking for people with at least 36 repeats, positive for these variants, depending on which cohort is recruiting at that time, with mild clinical symptoms. Um, and there are a number of um, assessments that will be done. So the pre-screening, as I say, is very simple. It's a, s a brief clinical assessment in the bloods. But then once people get through that initial hurdle, um, there are more rigorous clinical assessments that we'll need to do. And this is before going on to the treatment. And then these columns uh, are once people have received the injections. So cohort one receives the low dose, the two milligram dose. Um, the sentinel patient, they're called, so the first patient in each cohort is monitored for a couple of days. So they, they'll be in, in hospital for two days just to make sure nothing um, untoward happens. Whereas the, the remaining patients, or the, the, sorry, it's the first two, after the first two will be in for a shorter period because we'll be more confident then that there's no problems. And then beyond that, various cohorts will be given four milligram, eight milligram and 16 milligram doses. And, the, and there's also a second multi-dose part to the trial. So there's, I guess, I'm not expecting anyone to remember how the trial's set up. I struggle with that myself sometimes. But the point is there are multiple opportunities to be involved, despite the relatively no, low numbers. So when I tell people, and the, the most often situation that I do this is when I'm seeing patients with multiple sclerosis about having a lumbar puncture a lot of them get a bit freaked out and that's understandable but and this is easy to say because I'm the neurologist and I've never had one but we think of it as being a bit like a blood test it's no more of a big deal than that but it obviously is to the patients but I just want to reassure you that it's a very safe procedure so I w would advocate um, what Kat had, which is a sitting up lumbar puncture. Was your sitting up? Yeah, sitting yeah, up. Yeah. I'll show you the video. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason is when you lie down, so this is the traditional way of doing a lumbar puncture, your, your spine curves into the soft mattress, and so it can make it a bit trickier. So I would recommend patients have them done sitting up, but if you go to a different centre and you have it lying down, please don't complain. Um, <laughs> it's better to have it done the way they're used to doing it. Um, but anatomically, your hips, so that you can feel them yourself, they're called the iliac crests. So those big pelvic bones that you can feel about here are at L4-5. So that's level L4-5 in, in the lumbar spine. And the spinal cord ends way up here. So that's at L1-2. So people are often worried that by having a lumbar puncture they're going to get paralysed or their legs won't work or something awful like that. And the truth is we wouldn't do them if that were, well, that were a risk, um, but it's not. So there are nerve roots down here and when a needle goes in sometimes the needle can jangle against those nerve roots and the effect of that is to get some electric shocks down your legs, but if that happens we just move the needle a little bit and it stops. So it can be, a, I mean, and it doesn't happen very often, but that's the worst thing that usually happens. And before we put the, sp the spinal needle in, you have some um, local anaesthetic for the skin. It doesn't go all the way down as far as that usually, so you can usually feel some pro poking and prodding. And depending on how straightforward or easy it is, there'll be more or less poking or prodding. So it is generally the case that in really skinny people it's a bit easier because you can feel the bones and you can aim your needle quite easily, um, whereas in less skinny people it can be a bit more of a struggle. But in general, it's, once you're good at them, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and so we can both take spinal fluid out, so filling this syringe if you like, but we can also inject the investigational product. And in this trial we'll be doing both. So we're measuring the Huntington protein in the spinal fluid, so we need to take samples but we also administer the drug into the same space. And obviously we can do those things at the same time. So some patients, well, 
all the patients that have the injection will have multiple lumbar punctures, so they'll get quite used to it. Um, so where are we going to do this? Well, um, some of you already come to the Royal Brisbane. I should have worked out which floor this, this is, but um, that must be nine, so we're up there. Um, so our clinic is at the Royal Brisbane, and um, if you come to the clinic and you meet the criteria, then we'll be very happy to screen you. Um, if there are people that don't want to come to the clinic and some patients even with symptoms don't want to come to the clinic and that's understandable, sometimes they find it all a bit too much and overwhelming, we're happy to see you outside of um, the normal clinic time. But in general, we'll recruit patients at the Royal Brisbane. Our study coordinator, who's a very experienced research nurse called Liz Arnold, um, works at the University of Queensland and UQCCR, which is just next door. So if you're looking at UQCCR in this picture, standing in the road, the hospital's just behind you, so you can see they're very close. And Liz might take potential recruits over to UQCCR to take their blood, do any questionnaires, um, take down details and that kind of thing. So you're kind of away from the clinical environment anyway. And within UQCCR, there's a imaging facility. It's a bit hard to get a decent photo because it's up on the third floor inside. But we've got very modern state-of-the-art um, MR um, scanners up there. So they're, again, separate from the hospital and in a kind of research, a bit more relaxed, a bit, bit less rushed environment. So if you are in the trial, then you'll get your scan done there. And that's the outside of Herf, which doesn't really tell you much. So it's all, all on the same campus. So if, you, if a patient gets that far and gets to the point of having the injection, that will be done at a place called Q Farm, which is um, a clinical trials unit. So it's not part of the hospital. It's a separate entity where they specialise in doing clinical trials. And you would stay, it lo looks just like a hospital, but honestly it's much cleaner and much nicer than a normal hospital. Um, and that's where you would stay. And they even have facilities for a relative to stay with you in a, an adjoining room, um, if that's what you want. Um, but I put this picture up just to... Um, point out how everything's kind of co-located. So that's the main hospital where we're on the seventh floor. This is UQCCR, which contains HERF, um, and Q Farm is sort of in between those two buildings, but again, it's quite difficult to get a photograph of. Um, so Royal Brisbane, um, Q Farm's here next to QIMR, and UQCCR is right in between. So they're all right close together. Um, so it's going to be easy for people to go between the different places without getting lost. So who's doing this trial? Well, I'm the principal investigator for our site. It's also being done in Melbourne. Um, and Julie's um, the kind of top person in Australia and coordinating everything. Um, they're also doing this trial in Sydney and Perth. So I think, is that right, Julie? Have I missed anywhere? That's it. Um, so many of you will know John O'Sullivan, who works in the clinic with me, so he's an associate investiga investigator. And Matt Katz, our movement disorders fellow, is the other doctor on the trial. But probably the person anyone involved will have the most contact with is Liz Arnold, who's the study coordinator and research nurse at UQCCR. But many of you will already know Lily Tang, who's our clinical nurse at the Royal Brisbane, and she'll certainly take details of anyone who's interested in being involved. So, I don't know, oh, I've talked for long enough, good. Um, so, thank you very much to Huntington's Queensland for inviting me to talk to you today, but also thank you for your support in getting this trial site up and running. Um, without that, I think we'd have really struggled. Um, so, thanks particularly to Jan and Susie who were involved in that. Thanks to Julie for inviting us to be a site and, and considering us, and we've always wanted to be able to offer research involvement to our patients and it's something that we're asked for a lot. Apologies to Teresa, I've spelt her name wrong. Um, no, I know, I, I was guessing. I was nowhere near apparently. Um, um, but it, it honestly is a pleasure to see both of you every month at our clinic and get your insight into 
the things we don't necessarily find out about in the 20 minutes that we get to talk to our patients. Um, but most of all, thank you to our patients, their families and their carers um, for the privilege of being involved in their lives and hopefully maybe involving some of you in our research. Thanks very much.